Yes, yes, yes. Shalom, Chabarim. Shalom. First thing we'd like to say right here, here, here. Baruch Ata Yahuwah Loheinu Malek HaOlam. Dayan HaEmet. Something that we say when we hear about the tragedy. We, the black Jews of the line of the tribe of Judah, bless art thou, Jehovah, our Elohim. Eternal King, King of the Universe, Universal King, Universal King, the True Judge, Dayan Ha Amet, the Judge of the Truth. Whenever we hear tragedy, this is what we say traditionally, you know. And condolences, you know, we commiserate with the families. This is regarding the Buffalo, the race terrorism that occurred in Buffalo, and those uh, ten um, people who reportedly were murdered, you know, were basically murdered in cold blood in this racial, this white supremacist, this white racial, white race terror act, this terrorism. It's basically terrorism, domestic, domestic terrorism. I don't know whether they're calling it that because, you know, there's a lot of always the politics and everything. You know, politics is victory chased by defeat. You ever heard that before, that politics? Well, actually, the politics. Because not really politics, because real politics would be talking about real policies. And that's why we're calling this one right here. Do black people have the right? I say black people, see my Americas, namely this North country, the Americas and Caribbean. Do black people have the right to defend themselves? I know it sounds, sounds, sounds really crazy, right? What do you mean? The, of course, people have the right, anybody, right? Anybody should have the right to defend themselves by masking. Right here, here, this is Ross Iadonis. Adonis Tafar Yadin, Yadin Ben Chayil here, L-O-J, Society of His Majesty. Yes, so here, here, here on the Rastafari Yehudim, Rastafari Jews channel as well. Check out also the Rastafari Israelites and, you know, our evening live stream right there. But here, this has happened about three to four days ago, about four days, roughly going on four days as of this recording right here. And this is interesting because this happened in America. Now, something else also happened. Right, a major incident in Africa, in Nigeria, where a Nigerian, I think it was Sokoto, a Nigerian student, a female student, a Christian student, right, was, um, was, was killed, was murdered by a mob. And according to the news reports, an uh, uh, Islamic um, extremist uh, mob, they say Islamic extremist mob, and they burnt down the school and other people were also hurt. But this... This um, young um, Nigerian um, woman, she was killed because of something she had said on a WhatsApp, a social media chat. She said something to the effect of, um, I think, you know, why are you talking about, you know, religious things, Islamic things, religious things. And this is a school, you know, something that regards a school and everything in the word got out, basically. And they tried to get her, I think, the first day, but, you know, she was hidden and she was basically able to be, you know, taken from this university or college or something like that in Nigeria over in the continent that's called nowadays Africa. Right? And I think the next day, the mob, everything just increased, you know, because there was this bloodlust, this bloodthirst. People were bloodthirsty because they said that, you know, Sharia law, according to these um, who are called Islamic terrorists or Islamic extremists over black people. We're talking about black people. We're talking about Africans. We're talking about Africa. You know, there's a lot of, you know, we are Africans and this is Africa. So let's really get a good stock of, of what we're talking about and, you know, where we're talking about. And if we're making this connection with the continent called Africa, then this is real news that right now news. This is not, you know, 100 years ago, you know, or something like that, or even 50 years ago, or maybe even five years ago. Well, actually five years ago, this was going on as well now of course i'm first of all looking at these two particular cases these two particular cases looking over here in the west and we the beta israel right of the west we the ones who lost now found black and brown people of the house of yisrael that's who we really are if we really get to the roots of it you know after this 400 years you know that that's the reality that, that's just the reality that people want to argue it so forth and so on but what's so very interesting and heal up you know, to I and I fellow of other camps, and we could say maybe of other denomination, other camps, you know, the other brothers and sisters, you know, especially the brother and the Israelites, the one West and the other camps as well, because a lot of that, what they have been saying too about, you could say Africa, the continent, even though we have some, um, some, um, 
I'm not going to say really extremists, because not really extreme. When we look at the, we're in an extreme, you know, to say um, extreme situations, like extreme circumstances call for extreme measures, like extreme circum, in these extreme circumstances we are. It calls for extreme measures. Others are carrying out their own forms of extremism. And once again, like the prophecy says concerning the Beta Israel, once again, we are the victim. Right? We are the victims directly and we are continually victimized. So we ask the question, do black people in the Americas, namely, uh, well, well, we can act, this could be universal, but we first of all, like when the stone drops, like we you know where the stone drops in the water, let the ripples and the wave, wave, you know, ripple to the, to the edge of the earthly plane, right? But do we have the right, right? Do black people have the right to defend themselves? Now, people say, well, 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 why are you saying this? Well, we're saying this based on the facts of the matter, the facts of our reality, looking at our reality. Of course, maybe other people's, you know, other peoples, other nations, ethnicities, groups, you know, you know, might say that we just we just talking about nothing because this doesn't affect them. This this affects us. What about those 10, you know, people may the almighty, you know, um, bless, you know, and rest their soul. May they rest in peace and rise. You see, we're all about that resurrection. It's about the resurrection. You know, it's about the resurrection. It's interesting because even Revelation says how ones and ones did not repent, right? They did not repent of their murders. But it's because of this point here that we hear so often, right? There's this particular point that we hear so often. Like the world must know that Jewish people, right, have a right to self-defense just like any other people. Now, Menachem Begin, one of the, um, let's say, uh, prime ministers, I think, of the state of Israel, you know, had said this many years ago, right? And um, as we observe the news, when, when news reports come up, right, when news reports come up, usually we hear this over and over in news reports, like, say, some of the, the Palestinians or Hamas or some of the so-called radicals and extreme so-called groups over there, you know, back and forth, Palestine, the, the, the European Jewish state of Israel, the back and forth that goes on, you know, between the two sides and say the Hamas or one of them, you know, on the other side that are opposed to the state of Israel, they shell and rocket and bomb and everything. And then the Israeli army, you know, send out its jets and its missiles and it responds, right? It, say, it retaliates, it responds. Or... As they say, it expresses the right, their right to defend itself. And we hear this over and over. The politicians, you know, the political leaders, you know, in the great house, in the White House will say, you know, well, you know, we're very sad. So far from someone about, you know, the collateral or, you know, uh, you know, people, you know, if Israel over, you know, over overdoes it. Right. And some innocent people are reportedly, you know, killed in the Israeli um um, defense, <laughs> you know, or, or in their, in their um, response to this attack, right, you know, we always hear, regardless of the situation, regardless of the situation, if, if, if somebody attacks the state of Israel or the Israeli, we could say citizens in the state of Israel, and the Israeli government responds to defend their citizens, you know, their people, you know, just in that context there, we hear from the media around the world, but especially from like the, the governments, you know, over in, you know, America, you know, in this North country, as well as, you know, oceans apart over in the UK, you know, the cousins, the cousins basically will defend the cousins and they'll say, well, you know, you were very sad about the, you know, innocent loss of life, but, you know, we just want to remind, you know, the world and remind everyone that Israel has, has the right to defend itself. And I said, Chan, that's interesting. Now that we hear one time, we hear two time, right? We hear it many times. We hear it time after time, like that movie. I like that movie. You ever seen that movie, Time After Time, right? I think it was Malcolm McDowell and everything, and Mary Sturbergen or something. I forgot her last name, but yeah, interesting movie right there. It's like a time machine. It's a time machine movie. You know, it's almost like wait. Uh, are we really living in this time or are we living in another time? Because it seems like time after time is the same thing. It's like a loop. It's almost like a loop. Like this meme right here, the eyes are useless when the mind is blind. It's anonymous. We don't know really who said it or whatnot. But, you know, the eyes are useless when the mind is blind. Right? Just to share that right there. Right? Share this right here. 
right? Then I caught this here too, as we were just doing some research here, right? To respond to these two different incidences, right? From west and east, east and west, right? And these, both of these incidents are attack against black people, right? But get this here. One is from black people, you know, because people say when they talk about, oh, you're talking about Black Lives Matter, people say, well, what about all the black on black killings, you know, when black people are allegedly killing black people? And they say, well, that's really more, you know, an issue, it should be more an issue than the so called, you know, um, um, occasional. I know some of y'all are going to really wild out on this, but occasional or random racial incidents. I'm not agreeing that it's occasional or random, but a lot of ones will say that it's occasional or random. Right? Now, I'm not saying that we as so-called black people over here right, in this diaspora right, don't have matters amongst ourselves. But even while we try to work out those matters amongst ourselves right, and, and, and balance the equation and come to peace and harmony in our own community, it's both within and without. So even if we do have domestic enemies amongst ourselves as black people say, well, you black people have problems. You're always blaming the white man for everything. Well, even if that's so, what we can't get away from is that do we have the right to defend ourselves, right? And this, this is like a double-edged sword. This is like, do black people, even among black people, you know, if a white person kills another white person, it's basically just, well, what was the reason why? It's nobody, or rarely do people say, well, it's, it's, it's white on white violence. <laughs> so you have to understand the psychological game, you know what I mean, that reptilian game. But here it says that Jewish leaders say, right, the Jewish leaders, and of course we should kind of like put this in context, usually it's like European or white Jewish leaders, because when our Jewish leaders, black people, we the black people who identify as Yehudi, Yehudim, even of the lion of the tribe, of the tribe of Judah, when we you know, say something similar, people get into all this argument about whether we really are, you know, Yehudi Jews or Israelites, and we have to prove this and prove that and all of this and all that other stuff, you know what I mean? So let's just cut through all of that, right? But the Jewish leaders, right, since they're Jewish, that means it could be white Jews and black Jews, and it's Jews, Jews are Jews, right? Isn't that supposed to be the fact, right, according to the premise, right? Now, all other racial stuff is where it gets cloudy, Right? But Jewish leaders say, we won't be distracted, we won't be divided. Mm. Can we have an amen? Vimru? Vimru? Amen. 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 Right? Yeah, we won't be distracted, but we're always distracted. We over here, right, in the diaspora, right? We the beta Israel over here in the West, so called black folks, black people. We're always distracted, right? And by getting distracted, on one hand, we always become divided. Right? Now look at this one here, Hatikva. Hatikva means like the hope, the hope, the expectation. Right? Hatikva says, Israel has the right to exist. We should really do a video on that. Do we black people have the right to exist? <laughs> do we? All right? And don't need to explain. Uh-oh, word? Wow. You know, the, 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 the boldness. But, but, but then again, you know, Weakness, what have we gotten from weakness, right? I, I heard an interesting statistic just concerning the whole Buffalo thing, and they said that the situation in Buffalo, especially regarding education, regarding health, regarding income, right, in Buffalo, the same area where this, um, this race terrorist, this white race terrorist that had killed the 10 people we began off this vlog with, you know, they said that that's one of the areas that is worse there for the black people in 2022, right, than it was 30 years ago. It's worse in a sense of on the levels of economics, on the levels of education, right, and on the level of the most vital wealth, health, than it was 30 years ago, right, 30 years ago, right? So we really have these questions and answers that need to be my ask needs to be answered, right, and solutions to this. And one of them, I think, is this right here that we're doing right here, is just asking the question, do we have the right to defend ourselves? Do we, like other peoples, and even like the state of Israel, do we black people like the state of Israel have the right to exist? Do we have to explain, right, or excuse ourselves to other peoples, white or black, Right? Because there's a lot of different black people that are not really us, but they are black people. And they also are victims of white race and white supremacy, but also they're victims of 
black on black crime because when we talk about the Nigeria thing with the Christian girl who was killed by um, Nigerians who happened to be Muslim and very you know extreme or radical about their faith they say Sharia law and they were willing to take I guess Sharia law is in their own hands so they took it into their own hands and they defend themselves now state of Israel does the same thing right even here in America if a white man shoots another white man yeah they probably will arrest him and everything but notice what they did even with this man who was all armed suited and booted and everything for war against unarmed right unarmed civilians Right? victims of racial terrorism. I mean, this is real race terrorism, not like a black man says, well, I don't like a white man or, or, or you white such and such, and he calls the white man a name or a white woman a name, and they're like, oh, he's such a racist, what? We need education. See, so education, not just in Buffalo, but all over, you know, if one thinks that if a black man or a black woman says something, you know, just expresses an opinion about a white person, it's of the same caliber, right, as, for example, right, this white race terrorist that just murdered in cold blood, right, 10 people, right, at least 10 people, because, you know, as these things go on, sometimes there are other victims. I mean, even there are other victims. The victims are not just the ones who were murdered. Right? The souls and the lives that were taken. And there's no way in the world that we should, in, no black person, no Christian, especially no black Christians, you know, a lot of days these black Christians should say they forgive. That's where you go wrong against your God, against the Bible, against everything you believe in so-called, quote, Jesus name is when you say, well, you forgive them. The same thing happened in South Carolina was checking out the PBS um, News Watch or whatnot like that. And they had black man told me he was actually in South Carolina. Right, a couple of years back, right when this um, another racial white race terrorist went to a black church, it sat up amongst them. You know, they treated him with hospitality and everything. It was having Bible study, whatever, and he just pulled out and he killed right black woman and 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 men. Right? And I say woman, I want to emphasize that because we scroll back to the victims, you see that a lot of these were like elderly, you know, like like elder woman, you know, were our our elders and women. Kill. So, so there's a misogyny here too, as well. You know what I mean? I mean, they, they, he's not going after <laughs> ones who are shooting back or who can shoot back, right? Even though those who might shoot back on him, they might say, "Well, do they have a right gun rights? Uh oh, they're carrying guns illegally. What about this guy? Oh, he probably carrying the guns legally. Oh, what about the fact that he was still armed and everything when they kind of talked him down and negotiated and everything, and then they take him away, like, like you know, like he's a war veteran or something like that." I guess in some people's minds, he is <laughs> now a war veteran, right? So here, what about this? Hatikva, right? The hope, Hatikwa, the expectation, Hatikva, right? It says, Israel has the right to exist and doesn't need to explain, neither, neither excuse itself when other nations think otherwise. Can, can I get my dual citizenship? Come on, guys. I mean, what, what is wrong with y'all? Can we get our dual citizenship? Can I get my dual citizenship? You know, can I and I? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because you want to you want to stand with ones and ones that recognize that you and they, like I and I, that we have the right to defend ourselves. Not be in no situation where you don't have no right to defend. You got to explain everything. You know, even if you're getting you know brutalized, raped, murdered. You know, by overt racist, right? who are acting even illegally according to the latter-day racist laws. Because it's still racism. It began off in racism. It began off bad. So what you think is going to happen, right? But here, the state of Israel says they have a right to exist. Exist. See, because they peep it in their situation, you know, even the European Jews and the others and even many of our people over there, we recognize what it is over there. They recognize, you know, that their right to exist Right is threatening, but we think that oh well, we have a right to yeah we say we have a right to exist, but it's it's like um when Martin Luther King was crossing this bridge, it's it's said I heard ones and ones from back then said that when he was crossing this bridge, you know the white racist um sheriff and 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 um law law enforcement right racist law enforcement had blocked the bridge or something like that you know with their troops right and the civil rights um. Um, um, advocates, you know, for justice were led by Martin Luther King, 
and they could not go no further. So Martin Luther King was said to have like, you know, turned around to the people and said, come on, let's, let's pray. You know, he's a reverend, you know, so he's going to trust in the power of, of his God. So he, he got on his knees and he started to pray. You know what I'm saying? And the white man, he's, the white man's right there. You know, he basically, he basically violated something right there in the Bible. This is interesting. Martin Luther King, his intention was good, but the white man is like opposing him and saying, y'all can't go any further. So he stops right in front of the white man that's like stopping him from crossing the bridge and everything. And he basically bows on his knees. He basically bows before the wicked. Because the man was acting wicked. He was acting against the law. You know what I mean? He was acting in a racist way. You know what I mean? Because, see, we know they're racist, but then they try to give us this law that says it's for everybody. We're all Americans. We're all the same thing. The law is equal. You know, we're not a nation of men, right? But we're a nation of law, right? We're a nation of law, not of men. But it seems like the laws might favor a certain kind of so-called men, and that basically is white men. Right, white men, because we can see even how they talked this guy down and they took him away. I got a, I got a picture, a clip of still, right? And he's wearing khaki, you know, and camo, you know, and not, not khaki, he's wearing the camo, the camo. He's wearing it's like the camouflage and everything, like he's, a, like, he's a, like he's a soldier. And they're taking him away. I think he even had a mask on. I said, wow, look at that. He's even wearing the mask, you know, for the whole COVID stuff. I said, ain't this something? Well, he didn't violate that, you know, because he's supposed to wear a mask in public. So he, he's wearing a mask in public, right? And also said that he even said to the... Um, he went, he was scoping out the place, you know, he was scoping out the place from a month or so ago, drove over 200 miles or something like that. And just the other day, he had told some of the employees in there that he's going to come back, you know, he's going to kill them. And see, here's why it gets so bad, even amongst us, right, that when somebody threatens, like right now, if it was a black man that walked in the store and told some black people in the store, hey, I'm coming back, I'm going to kill you. You know, we would react much better about that. This is what's so very interesting. We would react much better about that. When I say much better, you'll recognize, you'll take it as a threat, right? As an existential threat, right? It's a threat to your existential, has, a, has its root. The root word of existential is exist. When they say this is an existential threat, they say that to say that it's a threat to our existence. And these two incidences are symptoms of the increasing existential threat to we, the black people of the world, but particularly over here in the Americas and the Caribbean, but in this North country, right? So we just like that statement. This statement here is very powerful. I mean, we should even ask the question, um, do, um, do black people have a right to say such things? I mean, has any black people said such thing that, wait, hold on for a moment. We black people have a right to exist. Right? And we don't need to explain or excuse ourselves, you know, to other peoples, right? If, and then when other peoples think otherwise, right? Like I said, every time something happens in the news between the state of Israel and, the, and their opposition, or you could say enemies, or the Palestinians, or this group, or that group, and something happens, and Israel, you know, um, defends itself and sometimes in some of the incidences we could tell that yeah they did like over 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 overdo it right i guess that's to teach the other people a lesson you ever watch those movies and they say we're going to make an example right i guess they want to make an example right in their right or someone would say like this meme here says israel has the duty to defend itself and this is posted on facebook it's israel under fire Right, and they have a Twitter. Israel under fire. Black people under fire. Blacks under fire. Right, we're under. Are we not under fire? And not just in America, right, but worldwide. And also in places like that, we claim, right? You know, we'll claim we're African. We black people from Africa. Well, let's just look at this particular situation that occurred over there, where a Nigerian Christian girl student, she expresses her, what do you say, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. Is that freedom of speech in Africa? <laughs> like even over here, to a certain extent, right? To a certain extent, you know, more than anywhere else, right? We, not just black people, but people over here have a freedom of speech. I'm not saying that your, your speech, whatever you say, is not going to be uh, uh, equal and opposite or what some type of reaction to what you're saying. You know, of course, you're going to have to recognize that. But just on the basic principle, like if this girl was over here and she said the same thing, most likely, most likely, 
most likely they would not be that. Maybe some of the Muslims or the Islamists, they would be upset. Maybe they would do certain things, but they would never do what we see was done over there in Nigeria. Why? Why? Because of the response that there would be my, from the government. So that means that we have to think about this when we return, as people say, this, we go back to Africa, going back to Africa, right? We have to look at these 54 nations, right? Look at these nearly 3,000 plus tribes, right? And, and, and the, oh, uh, 200 languages and dialects plus, right? And we have to really figure out, well, what is best for us? What protects our right to exist? Where would we have equal right and even um superior rights right to defend ourselves now see i can't even talk about that so much i'm just using that as a as a um like as a, as as an example right because these two things happen notice these both these incidents happen right right within the space of a day i think they're both maybe a day apart like right? when i go and do my research i find that the the thing that happened in Nigeria, it seems like some of the oldest stories about like uh, three days ago. And the thing that happened in Buffalo is roughly about two days ago. So we have like between two and three days. So roughly, right, in East and West, over on the continent, right, what people say the motherland or Africa, right, and over here in the Americas, right? But it's this point that is not made by us that needs to be made that black people have the right to defend themselves, right? That black people. Now, see, notice they didn't say that everybody has the right or every nation. They say specifically here, Israel, right? Because when Israel does defend itself, other people, we don't say that, well, they have killed innocent and, you know, they, they, there's a problem there politically, blah, 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 right? And America, right, the same country that we're supposed to be citizens of and have some stake in. Do we have a stake in America or we're on the stake of America? Think about that, you know, in, in terms of our black Lord and Savior. You know, are we, are we, do we have a stake really here, right, right? Or is we continuing a mistake right here, right? Because now if we don't defend our right to defend ourselves here, then woe to us anywhere. Think about it for a moment. Think about what we're saying for a moment, right? Because over there and what happened with Islamists over in Nigeria, Right? The, against the Christians, that's not the first time something like that has happened. That has happened. We heard about Boko Haram. That, it kind of goes on and on and on. Right? But it don't seem like the Christians, right? especially the Christians under the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant under counterfeit Christianity. Right? I say it's counterfeit because many of the white people who are also Christians, right, what do they do? They defend themselves they they get they, they use their gun rights right we, we know we, we know this so is there two forms of christianity that the white people who are christians right they can have guns to defend themselves right at least when i say at least they do more of their guns and did more of their guns but but they still express as christians their gun rights i'm not saying all christians but we see a sizable when we look at the history of white people and christians it's like there's two forms of christianity Right? For black people, it's to do like Martin Luther King did. Oh, I didn't even finish that one up right there. So Martin Luther King, right, because it says like it's, a, you know, for, for a righteous man, you know, to, to, to bow to the wicked, right? For a righteous man to bow to the wicked. Let's see if we can bring this up right here. A righteous man. Let me see if I can remember the King James translation because some things we, we're trying to get past, you know, just the... Um, you know, get past the, uh, how can we say, the King James, because what we're recognizing, right, is that the other Jews, right, other Israelites, other Jews, say the Israeli Jews, they're not limiting themselves, right, to the King James version of the Bible. But even the white Jews who read in the King James version of the Bible, oh, it's fall down, yeah, fall down, fall down, yeah, fall. Let's go over here, right? Um right here right there we go um proverbs 25 26 proverbs 25 26 so the scene is Martin Luther king and the other um 
black and civil rights activists are one across a bridge to make a protest. And as they are going about, the white racist sheriff and his troops and everything, they block the bridge. So Martin Luther King, he bows and bends on his knee right in front of the white man to pray. Right? He's praying to God, like, you know, to help change situations so they can keep protesting, keep marching, and the, some other white man would, would remove himself or whatever like that. Right? But he basically, as it says in this verse, Proverbs 25, 26, a righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. Right? So when Martin Luther King did that, it is reported that the white man, right, the racist, he said, right, the white racist, he said, Boy, your prayer, your prayers ain't going no higher than your head. He said, Boy, your prayers ain't going no higher than your head. Right? He said, Whoa, whoa, whoa. All right? <laughs> like, boy, your prayers ain't going. Now, I thought about that and I said, Chan, first of all, he could have stood on his feet. You see, Judaically, Hebraically, <laughs> right? We stand when we pray. Right? There was something as a standing prayer. Not that there are aspects of prayer that we might, you know, we bow, so forth and so on. You know what I mean? But, but when you study, see, a lot of black Christians don't really study because if even Martin Luther King studied this. One thing we could say even about the Islamists and the extremists, right? When they're reading their Quran, right? And their imams and their teachers are going to the Arabic. So when it says, like, fight against those who fight against you or, or who fight against Islam or whatnot like that, in the, the Arabic, it says, kill those, slay those. But the English translation, like, like, like Yusuf Ali, Mamadou Pikno, that a lot of the black so-called Muslims are under, it's just like the black Christians. You're under translation, right? And even the translation you're under, you're not really fully observing that. That's why I use the Martin Luther King example, where he went down on his knees to pray. Right? Well, Hebraically, according to the scripture, the Bible, we stand when we pray. There's the Amidah, there's the standing prayer. Yes, there is bowing at certain points of the whole rite and ritual, but the prayer part, we stand before the heavenly king, before Abinu Sheba Shemayi. Right? But Martin Luther King, because of the counterfeit Christianity, the whitewashed Christianity, you know, um, that he and many of us have been made to be like Eve. He fell down on his knees to pray, and as he was praying, the, the, the racist white man, right, he said, boy, your prayers ain't going no higher than your head. And that's why this verse says here, a righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. No wonder Martin Luther King later on before they, they assassinated him. He said that he was afraid, telling Harry Belafonte that he had feared that he was integrating black people into a burning house. But what do we used to say back in the house music days and the clubs back in the days when we used to do those sort of things, right? You know, in the course of the world that we went, the roof, the roof is on fire. We don't need no water. Let the MF burn, burn, mother. Right? You know, we don't need no water. I thought that was interesting because it was right after the 60s. Right, that we started to become more self-centered, individualistic. That's where our communities fell apart as black people and everything. And many of us, as we was growing up, you know, we got into the house music the club, you know, the going out, so forth and so on. And that was a popular tune, right? And I always thought it was kind of ironic because if we really in a burning house, we're just dancing, having fun, and just having a good old time. But then I began to recognize, I started to grow in grace and the knowledge of the King of Kings Christ. I began to recognize, right, with the true eye, like Chan, this is our situation. That's like a microcosm. That's like a fractal, right, of the bigger situation, right? That when the movement changed from the 60s and many of the, you could say the leaders, the black leaders were, were martyred, were martyred, were assassinated. Right. Look at the course. Look at how our whole family life coming up from the plantation from 1865 right, to 1965. Look at after 1965. Look how everything. If you look at this on those charts that they do, like in business and, and finance, you'll see that we were going up to a high point And it's like we even like everything just devalued, like our whole community devalued itself. Our whole nuclear families, the nuclear families that black people had. Right? That was more so than even the white people. There was more stable families, nuclear families. There was a total meltdown. And all of these things happened right, at a certain point in time. You know, almost like, 
almost like if you saw buildings here and the whole city and things are beautiful and then you come back and it looks like a bomb exploded and that everything is torn down what would you expect it evolved like that no that the bomb basically was dropped on this place and destroyed the whole thing so if you look at pre-1965 right if you go back to 1865 and how we started to pull ourselves up black people here in america's by our own bootstraps and and advocate for what's right and go through all those fights and everything and then a hundred years later right we get the civil right race the rat race right the rights race or the rat race civil right race movement right 65 and we thought we won our parents our forefathers they thought they won something right but then look at what they lost it was like an exchange it was a compromise right after 1965 Right, the whole black demographic, if you really look at the demographics. And one thing we can thank, you know, the system, the government, and some white folks who, you know, do their jobs well, is the statistics. The statistics basically give us the evidence. So when we look at the statistics before, it's like something that Dick Gregory said, the two strongest forces in America, right, is or were, right, and potentially is the black woman, Right? And the black church. I think it's so interesting he says that. Right? Because we see two dramatic changes, right, with the black church, we could say, and the black woman. Now, is this saying that the black man is, 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 doesn't have any culpability? No. His culpability is because he allowed this to happen. It's only like this happened and we didn't even notice. Our, our, most of our forefathers, I say most of our forefathers, because there were some black men that saw it, that spoke up on it, right? That were saying something different than, you, you, you could say different than the, the multitude, was going against the multitude, they didn't follow the multitude to do wickedness and say the wickedness. You know, in the 70s, people thought like, oh yeah, now we really have made it. And we saw the boogie woogie, yah, yah, everything became so heathenistic, became so, so kind of just like, what's going on now? It's almost like the same thing. It's almost like what happened with the hip hop movement, in a sense, how it went from the real social issues and became more like kind of commercialized, right? It became a, a product of Babylon. It's the same thing that happened to us after the 60s, right? And we are still on this downward spiral. We still are on this downward spiral because we have not, you know, reassessed how we got here and what really went wrong. And we spend too much time on the blame game, right? The blame game, you know? Are we gonna blame the white man for this? Like even with what just happened, yeah, this white man, right? Or this white male, he did this act of murder, right? Of cold-blooded, race, racially motivated, right? A racially, mo a terroristic, a terroristic racially motivated act. Right? We don't have to make up even new terms. All we have to do is look at the terms that they use to defend people who are victims right, of unjust right, and unprovoked attacks. Right? Well, you know, as it is said, right? and we're using the state of Israel. Now, we don't agree with the state of Israel in a, in a lot of things, especially with their racist, you know, some of the racism, a lot of the racism against we black people, whether it's black people that came from the Americas, you know, like the African Israelites of Demona, whether it's the Beta Israel of Ethiopia, you know, whether it's other, you know, Hebrews or Israelites from other parts of the continent, right? Or some of the racial things to other groups coming from India or China or from other regions, even though it seems like even though, you know, the state of Israel, right, like America, does have a kind of a white, a white baseline, a white focus. You see what I'm saying? But it seems like even with what happens in the state of Israel, the more egregious acts that are documented, right, seem to be racially motivated, right? Now, it's not quite the same, but it, is, it does tell us that there is a virus, there is a plague. Why are we being singled out like this? Right. And then when we are, but it's a little different over there. Right. When I say it's a little different over there. Right. And then this is not to because I know some people say, oh, you're defending. No, what I'm defending is we black people and especially we black people that identify apart from the so-called European Jews who came into Judaism, according to their own document, 740 or so. No, we are just saying that we this is who we are. And then we're saying, well, in our expression of our Israelite and Yehudi and Jewish, and we as black people have a double, it's kind of double anti-Semitism that happens to us when you really think about it. It's double anti-Semitism that happens. On one level, 
right? It's the racial part of it against us as black people, right? That that, that happens whether from so-called like what just happened from this, this 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 white racist male over here, this white male, what he did with the killing and the murdering, right? And then, right, because of we identifying ourselves as Hebrews, or as Israelites, or let's say black Hebrew Israelites, or black Jews, or we Ethiopian Hebrews, Israelites of Ethiopia. Uh, however, we once the black this the racial ethnicness it becomes a whole different point it's almost like the law that is in black and white right becomes not in defense of our black rights in black and white but it, it becomes less black in black and white you know what i'm saying it's like it's really black and white right if these people because of who they are right are people are seeking to harm them and violate their human rights right and their right to exist you're going to say well well you support israel's right to defend itself do you support black people's right to defend yourself i mean defend themselves ourselves <laughs> do you support that right and it's not about seeking other people's approval let me mention that it's not about that it's about looking at this in a real sense and one of the saddest things actually is looking at, you know, some of the news reports and everything and seeing the aftermath. And it seems as though whatever the intention right, was of doing this, like whatever the intention was of doing this, it has achieved its objective. Right. You know, because some things are just done to put the enemies in fear. Right. Some things are done just to put the enemies in fear. Right. And that, that's all it's about. Right? It's the fear. It's the fear factor. Right? It's the fear factor. The psychological. It's a psychological aspect. See, war and fighting. People think war and fighting is just about war and fighting. No, there's the psychological aspects. Right? Sometimes you can fight and maybe you can, the other person can fight. But after a while, you know, one recognizes that, yeah, I could fight, but there's no need in fighting. And this brings the next party to a sense of peace you know, or, or not fighting. Sometimes when people are not willing to fight and willing to even express the intent to fight to defend themselves, this emboldens, right, the aggressor, right? Not just against that person or that group, but also against other persons and other groups, right? So it's like one, one neglect of injustice leads to other neglects of injustice. That's why we're showing you some of this historical, right? It ain't nothing new. Right? There was a time when ones could do what you see going on in these pictures. Now there's a whole bunch of paperwork and everything. Right? Oh, well, 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 well black people um, in the inner cities. And then the politics come in. You know what I mean? The tax and spend, the pro-choice, the godless liberalism. You know, that comes in. Right? And the Democrat, the, the Dixiecrat versus the Republican. You know, we get caught up. We get distracted. Remember we showed you it says we won't be distracted. We won't be divided. Black people on this subject matter about gun rights. We've been distracted. Right? And we've been divided. And here's the here's an interesting thing. We could almost solve two two problems, right? Two existential problems with one solution. Right? With one solution. Advocating for a change of these restrictions right to guns right amongst people especially black people in the inner cities that will solve two things right ultimately looking at the long which is the long game right the long game right because of course even when new laws come in right the new laws takes it takes time to educate right prepare and educate the people but the problem is this even though these were discussions back in previous times when racist attacks were attacking a particular group of people, we'll say the people of the book, right? We, the black, you know, the black sheep of the house of Israel, while it was attacking us, and this is what we're talking about the 60s. This here is deacons. This was something deacons with guns. This was interesting. They were deacons with guns, right? You know, there's this myth, the mythology of like the nonviolent, right? The nonviolent. I don't hear people talking about, well, Israel, state of Israel be nonviolent, or America, or America be nonviolent, or that, 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 that racist white male, he could have chosen a nonviolent way to express himself, right? But what do you say, the bullet or the ballot, right? So, you know, it seems as though we've been using the ballot a whole lot, 
All right. So and we're not advocating, you know, the 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 you know any particular group, right? Besides we, the black people, and right, the particular group that we say we advocate, well, of course, Beta Israel, right? We as Beta Israel, right? We as the Israelites of Ethiopia, right? We as black Jews of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, right? We as Rastafari Yehudim, yes. So in that context, yes, this is this is who we are advocating. We speak, you know, we can say we speak more for. Right. Amongst those who speak for. Right. Now, the black family subject matter, too, you know, you know, is is that's kind of goes along with what occurred, you know, from that's one of the things that that we lost that with the nuclear meltdown. Right. That nuclear meltdown of the traditional black family. Right. And that's has led to other, you know, other um, tragedies. But these ones and ones right here, I'm mean, gonna look at all of these ones. These ones were, were like a lot of our elders. We can all see that these were older, you know, were older men and women, right? These were elders right here. You know what I mean? I mean, when you destroy and kill the elders, you do something, my, my goodness, do you, do you know the importance, the role of the elders? In fact, one of the ancient techniques among conquerors Right when they were able to submit um, a native population, right was to um, kill the elders. By killing off the elders, you you cutting off like you know what they call like that ancestor, that ancestor memory, right? And that means whenever you kill the older people and you leave a lot of the younger people, right? This this enemy group or population or what have you. They can now, it's easy for them to, to, to reprogram, right? To reprogram the society because they would not have the intervention of the elders, the people who are older, the people who are wiser, you know what I mean? The people who no doubt also knew better, right? You know, that wisdom that every group, every group, that, that every group of people that is, I want to I want to mince my words here, but let me say it as I just see it to say it right. That is worthy, right, of being called a group of people, understands and should understand the role of the older people, the elders, right, in every culture and every society. You know that that is worth its salt, so to speak. You know, there's always that 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 reference to the protection. Right, that that ven veneration, even in the sense of the elders. I mean, it's it's in your Bibles, you know, as well. You know, so many mentions of the proper respect and role, right, that we should have for elders. And these were elders here, right? These were elders who were who who were killed, murdered, right, and who we could say died, or yeah, in the most in the most horrific, right, in the most right horrific um sense right these are elders who died who, who were well they died yes but they were they were like deaded on they were like put to death in the most horrific the most horrific way brothers and sisters and even others come on now you're going to reach this age in life after all you went through and you're going to be put to death and murdered in a violent racially motivated um, a terrorist attacked. Can you imagine the chaos? And, and this, this was their last moments, right? For all that they experienced, all that they had endured. You see what I'm saying? All that they had gone through, all that they endured, right? To, that, that's their last moment. See, I see, I don't know if ones and really, really consider that because some of you youngins and, you know, some of the youths, you know, Jack calls on the youths because they are strong, but they need to be be still and know the role of the elders in the community. It doesn't mean that all the elders are correct or the the older folks, but but that that wisdom. You see, what I'm saying this is this is the part. Like, when I look at this, it's not, and and I'm not saying it's better if it was other people. I don't want ones to think that we're talking about other people. But, but look at who the the victims were. Right. And they were the first victims. Right? They were the direct victims. Right. But everyone in that community. Right. It's like the stone dropped there and the ripples are rippling, 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 rippling. I mean, so many of us are also affected by this as well. 
right? And the psychological, the psychological trauma, right? Now here's the 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 white male racist terrorist, right? Who is the alleged perpetrator? And we use that terminology, you know, everybody's on the PC being politically and legally correct. He's the alleged perpetrator, right? You know, because like people say, well, he get his day in court. <laughs> <sighs> you know, okay. So we see right here, here. Now, the ironic thing is that he actually is said to have said, right, he's actually said to have said to some of the employees in this uh, establishment in which the attack, the terroristic attack right, and murders occurred, that he's coming back to kill them. And... The dismiss, you know, of course, you know, many people say, yeah, 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 whatever. You know, people laugh it off. But see, we've gotten to a point, you know, we started to play this game that we need to stop playing. You know, stop threatening people, even black and black and people black on black. So let, let's stop this. It's, it's BS. Because what it happens, it kind of lowers our resistance, right, to the real threats. It's like kind of joking, joking. It's like the boy who cried wolf. Like we're crying wolf, 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 wolf. And then when the real wolf comes, right, you know, Everyone get eaten up, you know, playing this game, you know, or even calling, you know, things racist that are not really racist. You see what I'm saying? And they said that, well, he was on this whole, he had a 180 page memorandum, like a, a, a more, a memorandum, I'm saying, yeah, 180 page. I told one I and I, um, fellows, you know, I and I, sisters, you know, I, I said, she don't told I, and hello, Sister Mariam, hello, Brother Miguel as well um i said you know 180 you look at the numbers 180 you know doing a 180 is to make a directly like to go in the other direction you know and he said do a 180 so he has this 180 degree i mean 180 page memorandum and something about oh white genocide he's trying to stop the white genocide right he's trying to stop the white genocide and he killed off all of those elders I mean, it was just probably random. He just had his gun. He just shoot him. So on. It doesn't seem like he. <sighs> yeah, right. So this is this is this is the this is the alleged right perpetrator. Right. I say alleged because we went did our research. This is what came up. We wasn't there. We didn't see it ourselves. But we're going based on the information that is being disseminated and circulated. Right. Now this is our response. This has become like a knee jerk reaction. Right. Yes, of course, to how are we going to remember or express some sort of commiseration right, for those who we had lost right, or those who, who, whose lives, who, whose lives was taken away from them. I mean, one of the greatest thefts. Right. This is like the great theft. Right. Somebody just stealing somebody's money. Right. Or, or something like that. That's bad. Yeah. But you now murdering them, stealing their life, just, just the way these brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, elders, friends and family, that, 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 that's, that, that's the greatest crime right there. That's why I said that black Christians get out of this forgiving people right, who murder somebody else, even if they murder somebody in your family. It's only that that murdered person, the person who is the victim, the person who has, whose soul was taken from them. That's what I was talking about the thing in um, 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 a couple of years ago in the, in the South Carolina church. You know, yes, we have roots down there, so that particularly also resonated with us, but still, it's the point, right? One's the ones, he was hearing ones from the church saying, oh, they forgive the, they forgive the perpetrator. I said, that is a crime there. I think we did the video some years ago. That's, that's a crime. I mean, it's a, it's a Christian, according to the Bible, it is a crime, according to the principle of the scriptures, of the faith, because the people there wasn't just like regular people who are just, you know, say not Christians. I can understand them using any kind of thing because you expect that they don't ascribe or subscribe to it. But those who say they ascribe, right? Because who is the victim? It's like somebody steals your money. It's, imagine somebody steals your money. And you tell me that so-and-so stole your money. And I say, oh, I forgive them. Forget about it. I forgive them. And, 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 you know, the person whose money, who's the actual victim of the crime, be like, it was not your money. So the same way, it was not your life. Only if your life was taken from you can you forgive the taker, the murderer. 
you can forgive the murderer, the murderer that has murdered you. You cannot forgive the murderer who has murdered someone else because what you're doing is you're, you're, you're a thief. It's like you're a thief. You're stealing what belongs to somebody else. You're stealing the right to forgive or not to forgive of the victim. All right? We need to get out of that. That's, that's a bad, that's a very bad thing, right? Because it's easily, you know, proven, right, by the same Bible and scripture, right? Because if you start to say that you're going to forgive somebody because you're a Christian, you're going to forgive somebody who murdered somebody else, right? Not you, right? You're not the dead one, right? But somebody else is dead. You don't know whether they, would they have forgiven? You might even say, I know they would have forgiven them. Well, let them do that. We said, well, how are they going to do that? Well, you know, this is why even the death penalty, right, that's a whole other discussion right there, right? We will say this just for the record. In principle, yes, we agree with the death penalty in principle. But in practice, no. Not in practice, you know, because in practice, look, gun rights. We agree with people having the ability to, like the Second Amendment, especially our people. You know, of course, I mean, look at the, our history, and look at how what's the presently happened is just like what happened in the past, even worse now. So, of course, we agree with, you know, the Second Amendment and all that, you know, with the gun rights and everything. But we don't agree with how it's being, um, how it's being practiced, right? It's not being practiced, um, as they would say, properly or they say fairly or justly. It's not being practiced with non-partiality. Right? It's, it's being practiced in a partiality way. Right? And whenever the law is partial or the implementation of law is partial, right, you have a situation that cannot help but descending into chaos. Right? And you know, one never knows. Right? Even us speaking and others speaking on this, you know, this may be like, why not the, I say the last time, what this might lead to. You know, what this might lead to. We, you know, you can't never, when you look at history, you ever look at history and, and just, when I say history, not way thousand years in the past, but you just look at history that you even know. Sometimes things happen, right, almost unpredictably, right? Like, like you didn't know that because this happened, this would lead to that. That's what I'm trying to say, right? Now, this is like a tale of two cities here, right? right? A tale. This is him and his family, right? This is him and the so-called suspect's family, right? This is one of the victims, Right, one of the victims, because there were many different victims, you know, family, right, on top, right? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Right? Um, now, you know, we, we could say some more on this, but we're trying to keep this in measure, you know, try not to get, you know, overly emotive, right? Because we need to, to use our balanced so called brain, both hemispheres, right, in the fullness of our Trinity, Triunity brain. We need to use our reptilian cortex. Right? What is the, 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 the fight or flight response telling us? What is the mammalian cortex right, telling us? What is the higher brain telling us? What about the left hemisphere? You know, a lot of us like a right brain, the emotional part, the loving part, the forgiving part. But we really need to take, you know, the Almighty has created us, uh, those who believe as we do, or just say that, that in the mind has two hemispheres. It seems as though, like they say, black people, you know, remember the old mythology, right? The old myth. Right? It was like almost like a programming as well. They say black people are more right brain. That means we have soul and white, and white people are more left brain. No, but notice we both have a left and a right hemisphere. It's just that we have overly used one hemisphere, one aspect, and woefully underused the other hemisphere and the other aspect by and large. Right? And since we are in balance and maybe on the opposite side, because of white race and white supremacy, white people have are affected by that, too. Maybe they have used the left hemisphere so much that that right hemisphere, the more feelings, emotion, compassion, understanding, you know, on that level is somehow so woefully underused. Right. And maybe what has caused this kind of bipolar cognitive dissonance among so-called black and white is actually white racism, white supremacy. Right. In these times of the Gentiles, of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant counterfeit Christianity and all the rest. Well, is this a black man right here? OK, this is a black, a black officer right here. That's good. I mean, I mean, make sure they see that the fact that he's a police officer, you know, because how many black men were holding a gun and they were police officers and they got gunned down. Right? see. See, there's something deeper here right, than just shouting and expressing emotion. There's something deeper here that's going on. Right? Something, it's something psycho-spiritual here, right, that's going on, 
right? It's not these guns or weapons or whatever that kill. It's people. Something going on in the heads and the hearts of people, right? Something that was going on in the head and heart of that white male, right, who is the alleged perpetrator, right, of this massacre, right? So what's going on in our heads and hearts? Right? And give thanks to this brother here as well and others. Black gun guns matter. Black guns matter. <laughs> right? Uh, I know that's to keep it tight and you know, but black gun rights matter. Right? Black gun rights matter. Right? And also we have to focus on the fact that the law obviously is being used in a very um a very partial way. It's not being used impartially. All the rhetoric aside. Right. And partially, there's many black people who have applied for, you know, gun rights and everything in their respective area and were denied. And they were denied largely because they were black people, plain and simple. You know, if you know the process, you fill out things, you go to your local police station, you give them reasons and so forth and so on. And basically they look at you and say, oh, no, 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 no. All right, you know, they're judging based on their own um, subjective. There's not the there's not the objective. We're looking at this, seeking to look at this objectively. There's not the objective, you know, application of law and rights. Right, we need to look at this from the objective perspective. Right, while that is still even somewhat possible, is that possible? How much possible is that? Right, you know. So just looking at some of the history, how we got here. You know, from that time to this time, right? See this, even this right here, some people call this um, a Nat Turner kind of pick right here. But even the white man holding the gun, right? The white male holding the gun to the black man, right? Against the black man. The black man, right, has a knife. That, that white male is still afraid, even with the gun. He would be less afraid if the black man had a gun too. You know why he'd be less afraid? Because then it'll be just like everything else with white man. You know, he, he likes a he likes a good fight, really. Right? And it what's out of balance is because he knows he can load up on guns. Right? He can load up on all guns. And even if he is caught carrying all the guns on his back and have one in his hand, that he knows that probably nine times out of ten, right, even when the police and law enforcement come up against him, he is going to be treated, right, almost like one of them. He's going to be treated as one of them. And we've seen it over and over with ones and ones, white ma males who have, who have, you know, a mental, they say mental health disorder. I, we don't know if they just do that, you know, and then they use that as an excuse. Maybe that's something worked out. Do what you do, you're going to do. And then when you get, you know, caught, act like you have mental health disorders, you know, and then we could take it as a mental health disorder, right? But then with black people, right, it's just shoot first and then we'll investigate later. First, with white men or white males, it's like even though they're known to have done a crime. I remember we saw one video where it's almost like more than an hour they're talking this guy down and he's brandishing weapon and so forth and so on. I think he even licked off a couple of shots, and 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 they're talking to him like 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 the guy is their brother because guess what? In their heart of hearts, when they see a white male. Nine times out of ten, there's more of a brotherly vibe than when they see a black male. It's just plain and simple. There's a brotherly vibe when they see, because otherwise, what else explains that? Even when you listen to some of the conversations, you know, that the police officers are having with a white male who has already expressed violence and done violence, probably killed and murdered some people. You know, it could be white people, black people, because we don't say that the white males are only doing this because he's done this in a lot of his community. So it's not just in the racial situations that we see this done. We see this done in other situations. Two people holding a gun, a white male, right, and a black man, right? Police run down on them, right? Who are they more likely to shoot and kill? And both of them could be police officers. It's like the black male has to make sure, like, he keep his badge shiny and seeable and viewable, like, you know, right there, like, so they can see it first thing. Or he has to say, I'm a cop. I'm a police officer. Like, law enforcement, whatever they say, he got to make sure you say that, you know, because, so what is all that about? Right? That's something that's not even being addressed. You know what I mean? That's not being addressed. I'm not saying that they're even going to address it, but we need to address it. We need to understand that. Right. And that's what we need to teach our children. Right. It's not hopeless. Remember, I just showed you Hatikwa. I showed the Hatikwa. Right. It's not hopeless. But it is hopeless if you're not willing to express that black people, that we black people have the right to exist. 
right? And we don't have to defend or excuse, right, our self-defense. We have a right to defend ourselves. We have a God-given right, right, to defend ourselves, right? And we also have, according to the laws as they stand, legal right. It's all dependent. We have to, first of all, persuade ourselves to stop being cowards, right? Both to what occurs in our own communities, right? Which is a matter, but that's not the matter we're discussing right here, but, but in looking at the full situation, that is a matter. Because that's what a lot of people like to put first. Like, first of all, you get your own house and order black people, then we'll let you have guns. Well, hold on for a moment. White people, you know, be killing each other, right, in some situations, and they get the talk down. They don't just shoot the person. You know, it's in rare situations, very rare situations. They just take out a white male who is armed and dangerous as they would just a black male who, uh, who just may have a gun. They might just hear, oh, this black man has a gun. He doesn't brandish it. He doesn't take it out. We don't even know if he had, I mean, there's ones who got shot and killed a little child and they didn't even have anything. Oh, it was a toy gun. You know what I mean? I mean, you, you see what I'm saying? So this is really the insanity that we're dealing with. And even though others might be insane, you know what I mean? You know, that this insanity. We have to take guard of our own mental health. And keeping our mental health means that freedom of speech, some things need to be expressed. Even if we can't act on it as fully as we would like to, as fully as we would need to, as fully as is a monacity, right? The first thing is to speak the truth. I say speak the truth to power. Give thanks Mika ben David, right? Mika ben David, right? Um, gun control and black powerlessness. There we go right there. Put that on the screen. Maybe we'll put that as a screensaver, right? And here's the interesting thing with the thing that occurred in um, Africa, thing that would occur in Africa that is um, in Nigeria with Islamic extremists, it's like they have the same situation over there, but it's different, right? It's different, <laughs> but it's, it's still this powerlessness, right? What's interesting is this, when the Islamic extremists arm themselves, or the Islamics arm themselves, even though the, the white rulers and everything may not like it, they treat it differently <laughs> because once the people themselves make a decision, it's just dealing with that. In fact, power likes power, right? If you're going to express weakness to power, because power only maintains itself in power by strength. So now if you're going to claim to be a power, you know, we talk about black power, right? And yet we don't have the, 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 the practice consistently of defending ourselves and our communities because we still are wrestling over this whole gun control and black powerlessness, right? The racist origins and legacy of firearm bans, right? And though it might not change so-called overnight, right? If nothing is done, it's gonna get much worse, right? And you know, what's interesting is that they will then use this incident that occurred with the black people as the victims to go against black people and to arrest and jail and you know arrest prosecute and jail right more of our population on weak trumped up charges while ones like this one right here oh my goodness uh, how is this going to go i know everybody's holding their breath waiting for the trial Ooh, what more trial do we need what more trials and tribulations do we need we already have this and this is the response right here right question do blacks have the right to defend themselves, right? Do black people have the right to defend? Basically, it's gun control. Do black people, gun rights. Do black people have a right to defend themselves? Do black people, USA, have the right to defend themselves? It's, it's all about defense. It's all about survival. It's all about our the ex existential threats to our existence, right? Like, these are existential threats. People say, well, the black on black crime and black people killing black people. Yeah, that that, that is a... That's a, that's a situation. Yeah, that's, that's a situation. But even in that situation, the black community is so woefully unarmed, right? And it seems as though that, and if you think about it, if I want to get a legal gun permit and everything, as, as someone that may not have a criminal or any criminality in my record or any, you know, have a good record, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. It's almost impossible in some areas, right? Because there's a lot of other people who probably would want the same rights, but none of us, we all are expressing weakness, right? This is, this is a weakness. And to the black male, the black man, right? So this is the fellow black men. 
we wonder why our woman, right? Some of our women, right? And from time to time, and some of them more time, not all, not all, not all, right? Doesn't have a respect of us, especially of this generation. Cause we're not even willing to talk about it, right? To talk about it, you know what I mean? <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? You know, because I know more ones and ones who probably may have guns, uh, you know, illegally, right? Because of whatever the occupation that they are occupied with, that are more willing to talk about it, <laughs> right? And even though many of them, some of them, I know some ones, ones and we know this happened. And it, it, this is my point I was about to say that um, I'm trying to do this legally and properly. And it's so difficult and even impossible for me to do it. And then I look around at, you know, um, friends or, or partners or people I know, right, who also, you know, do certain activities that might be called, you know, here or there illegal, but they also have, they, they bear arms. And some of them have gotten arrested. Some of them have gone to court. Some of them have been found with arms and with guns. And some of them be back on the streets pretty soon. I say, I say I, who's your lawyer? I mean, I mean, who is your, you know what I mean? For real, you got back, I mean, you know, sometimes I think, you know, and a few ones that I can, you know, go there, I'll be like, how come they let you out? For real, how come they let you out? You, you, you had, and so what we see is this dichotomy where it's like almost the system systemically is also a part of the existential um, threats, right? And it's partaking, right, with one hand, right? In the these ex, 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 existential threats, why, why I say that? Because if I'm if I have a gun illegally, right, many times out of ten, right, if I get caught with it, right, in some cases I may have to do time, but I know of other cases where a lot of them don't do time because it was, it was so very interesting, you know, is that we all know that there's a lot of ones who do bear arms. And it is not quite legal, right? But yet it seems as though there are no legal repercussions against them, right? And then there are others who are upstanding citizens, taxpayers, so forth and so on, and who live in some of the high crime neighborhoods that would only um, um, desire to have a weapon, right, to protect themselves, their family, their home, their property, right? You know, and it is almost impossible Right in the racist, um, um, impartial, I mean, not um, 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 partiality with the partiality in the implementation of First Amendment rights to black people. So, when we look at those sort of situations, right, and then some have gotten because it seems so impossible, and the law, or at least that the, the application of the law says no, it's really illegal. The law becomes unlawful, or we could say the the implementation of the law, it becomes um, illegal. The way they are applying it, it's a law, but they're applying it illegally. They're not even going through the legal, could a legal process mean that regardless of who it is, whether the person has melanation in their skin or doesn't have melanation in their skin, right? When they apply, it's just their record that should be looked at and whether they have any priors or whatever and what the situation is and they should be issued on the conditions that are so set, you know, to get training and gun safety and all of that and to take classes and to pass classes. Of course, one should do those sort of things. Those are just basic, you know, terms and conditions, right, of um, maintaining in good standing one's rights, you know, one's gun right. And then, then also, for the sake of those other citizens that might be a little scared, these things will be documented about who has. There's still a whole bunch of undocumented gun bearers all over America. You know what I mean? You know, some people that basically said, whatever, they'll, they'll prefer to risk, you know, whatever the jail time is or whatever the court situation is, right, than to, you know, just kind of be a victim, you know, be a walking victim. This is amazing back in those days that we could have this, the, what you see in the pictures, right? Now notice the NRA supported gun control, right? When the Black Panthers were the ones holding guns, right? The NRA, right? And then it says the Mulford Act was a 1967 California bill. It was a bill, right? Bail, bail, bill, right? Prohibiting the public carrying of loaded firearms in 1967, 
right? Named after Assemblyman Don Mulford, the bill garnered national attention after the Black Panthers march on the California Capitol to protest the bill. The bill was signed by California Governor, the Governor, Governor Ronald Wilson Reagan. Well, just Ronald Reagan here, but you know, remember back in the days it was like 666 with six letters in each one of his three names, right? right? But anyway, this is what happened there. So basically what happened is that they was able to use right, the racist, the racist fear, the biased, discriminatory, racist fear of black people. This racist, historical racism was used to get this particular bill, this Mulford bill of Assemblyman Don Mulford, right, to gather attention. Because once people say, ho, oh, oh, ho, look at, look at the black man. And here's the worst thing about it. You had a lot of black people who were under the fear when they saw this. They were afraid when they saw this. I didn't say we didn't have our work cut out, brothers and sisters, right? But the first thing is that if we can't even speak on it, right? They said, name it and claim it, right? What they say in the church, in the church, they say, name it and claim it, right? Name it and claim it. Just some very good um, points of reference right here, right? As well, brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, right? Uh, some of the books right here, the amendment, you know, these amendments, right, the first or the second amendment, you know, we'll just leave it here on the screen for a little bit. So hopefully pause it and read it. Just become a little familiar with it, right, familiar with what is said right there. Now, just because there are these um, amendments, acts, laws, and everything, no, it doesn't mean that they're going to keep to it. But we should be, you know, to be forewarned is to be what? Forearmed, right, so to speak, right? Right. There's also something very interesting just to see how gun control was used historically against certain marginalized groups, certain groups which would later on, by right, ignoring those warnings, would become victims of the most grossest um, uh, outrages against human dignity. You know, just to point that out there as well. Right. Learn what's what, you know, and see the gun safety classes, you know, you go through all that, you know. So from so on, a black man with a gun, right? That's what it seems to be. It seems to be this image right here. This image right here, it just bothers ones, right? I mean, bothers ones who are infected with the plague of racism. And that's not just saying certain white people or politicians, but that's also a lot of the victims, right? Speaking of the black people. You know, remember, remember, they say Jesus came to save his people, the Jews, the Israelites. And yet they say that it was Jews that were saying, the Israelites were saying, crucify him, crucify him. So that means that one can come to their own people and something can be for one's own people. And the people who need it can reject it. And the consequences of that is horrific, right? We're already experiencing the rejection, right, of the truth before. What we're going through now is the, the rejection of it. There was one that was warning black people then, but their voices were marginalized. So this was interesting right here, of course, for the so-called cat lovers and everything like that. But how to talk to your cat about gun safety and then the subtitle and abstinence, drugs, Satanism and other dangers that threaten their nine lives. <laughs> so this was interesting. I don't know if it's a real, real book. I was just going through a quick research. Right. But here, here, here. Um, the American Association of Patriots presents how to talk to your cat about gun safety and abstinence, drugs, Satanism, and other dangers that threaten their nine lives. We need to look at the dangers that threaten the nine areas of black people's activity. Right? The nine areas. I heard that this brother right here was the original um, Lone Ranger. That he got the whole Long Ranger from this black man right here, right? F uh, Frontier Marshal Bass Reeves, right here. That he's the original, uh, the original, the, the real person from which they made the fictitious um, Lone Ranger from, right? But this is all about so called Negroes with Guns. Very good book that was written some years ago, right? Some years ago, The Soul of Nigger Charlie. Then, you know, they put out some of this, which is feel good. But this also sometimes, like the Black Panther protest, it can be used against us, right? Not saying that the Panthers should not, the Panthers did what they should do, but it's how what was done against what they did that was right that we just we, we forget, 
right? We're, we're too willing, forgetful, right? Um, okay, so right here. Have you noticed that since the 60s, we don't call ourselves soul people? And we're not called soul people? It's like black people have lost their soul. And that's what I'm trying to say here. It's like we have lost our soul. Something has happened. A lot of walking dead, right? Um, right here, here, here. Coaching his wife, Ma Bell, right? This brother right here, here, here. We have uh, Roberts. He's the one with the book, Negroes with Guns. And it seems as though when he wrote this book, right, it was uh, so, um, you know, ones were like, how dare he, you know, talk about arming Southern Negroes. Now think about that with the church incident that happened. It seemed as though what he was talking about in his time nearly, um, that was nearly maybe, what, 40 years before that incident that happened with, uh, with that white um, male um, racist terrorist that killed those people in the Sunday in the in the Bible the Bible school thing a couple of years ago. They totally turned their backs on this. So we can be our own worst enemies. You know what I mean? Because if they had listened to him. Now what's interesting is that we can go back in time and look at say the European Jews, and when they were getting brutalized and attacked and their lives were being taken from people who didn't like them. They spoke similar words, even more, with more fire, with more righteous indignation, so to speak. But they spoke the same basic things. And their people, right, their people, even some of the people who wasn't all for it, they still did not fight against it because they recognized, you know, zebeze, like each, each Jew is responsible for one another. And the same way, right? Each of us is responsible for one another. So he was trying to be responsible. He did the responsible thing. And the great thing is that, you know, he has passed on. Ja, ja rest his soul, bless his soul, and grace rise in glory. This, this black man right here, his work still is around. Now notice this. He even was on the FBI Most Wanted poster because he was just advocating for the same human and civil rights and national rights that other groups have. That they'll tell the whole world that, hey, they're not racist. You know, it's not about racism. You know, you know, black people are citizens and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. But look what they have him right here, right? They say he possessed a large quantity of firearms. They actually have him. And this is, of course, because of that. Um, 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 who's that guy? Um, J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover. You know, because of him, right? Right there. Right? They say, okay, his race is Negro, nationality, American, so forth and so on. They have all his information here. They said, look, they say, they say he has previously been diagnosed as schizophrenic and has advocated and threatened violence. How many times have you watched other things when it's not black people but other people and they say all the pain and all the trauma and violence they've gone through and how it has affected their mental, but they're not, they're not crazy. They are just victims, PTSD. They're victims right, of um, white supremacy, white racism, you know, victims of, 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 of violence. So they want to say that, oh, see, see here's a setup. You see, here's a setup. J. Edgar Hoover was trying to set him up. William should be considered armed and extremely dangerous, right? Now, true, I want to follow up on, you know, what has happened with many of these ones and ones. We're just taking a historical, right, historical snapshot right here. Notice this black man here carrying this placard. He says, if Negro men can carry guns for Uncle Sam, surely they can drive milk wagons for Bowman Dairy. You know, black people in our rhyme, right? Our rhyme scheme, right? That's interesting. But notice what it says. If Negro men can carry guns for Uncle Sam. He, he's not my uncle, but you, you, you get what I'm saying, right? Notice what this is saying. This is basically just to get a job. He's saying that if I, I can fight in your wars, then why can't I, you know, work in your business? Now, just contrast it right here, right? Um, if Negro men can carry guns for Uncle Sam, if Negro men like white men can carry guns for Uncle Sam, then Negro men like white men should be able to carry guns to protect themselves, their family, and their community. That should be the case. But this is what it seems to be like, right? And of course, this might be like the police gun right now. Now, but I saw a better one. This is a better one, right? This is the reality. This is the reality of the black man, woman, and child. Right? The black man, woman, and child. We have the man here because to whom more is given, more is required. 
seeing that we're between the proverbial rock and the hard place. You see, so it's the black hand and it's the white hand, right? That's why I was talking from the very beginning, right? That with one piece of bread, right, we can feed two birds. Kind of like to use a sense of like, we can kill a bird, you know, two birds with one, uh, uh, nah, why, you know, come on, what, what's your problem? You know, because unnecessary violence to, unnecessary violence to animals, you know, and other living creatures, it's a, it's a sign of psychosis. That, that's a real sign of it. Oh, look at this right here. Uh-huh. Right? And then we watch the cartoons and there's no problem with him having the gun. But but it's that guilty conscience thing. You know, when I looked at this, I was saying, I wonder where I'll find a... No, I won't find no black child. Right? Because a lot of us as children, we see this. The children are so innocent. We think, oh, look at the boy who has a gun. That boy has a gun. Well, our children barely think, oh, this is white boy right, who has a gun. You know what I'm saying? We don't think about it like that. But now he can walk down the street shooting, 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 even with a gun. And almost never is a so-called police officer, white or black, for that matter, right, going to just shoot him down and gun him down like we have in many incidences of black children, right, you know, playing with guns, right, you know, like, and being shot. I mean, my mother took this gun that I had years ago when I was, it was for my birthday or something, and she hit it. And it, it caused a little bit of trauma. In fact, you know, sometimes when we do these things to protect our children, it actually causes in them more desire for that. But I remember how my mother, well, you know, told my pops, like, hey, we need to take this gun from him because if we take that on the street, you know, somebody, like some police or somebody, based on white man or police, you know, a white police will shoot him and kill him. Maybe some black police just thinking they're doing their job. Right. These are the peoples who we have to question whether they have a right to have guns. These are the type of people who, you know, it's a question of whether they have guns. You see anything in common? You see anything similar? <laughs> right. Is there anything similar? Right. And some of these people, too. But some of these people can have guns a little more so. Right. You know, they, they get a pass. Right. OK. Right. OK. This was interesting because I came across some in my historical research, went back to the 60s and here I saw like women's wrestling. I said, oh, wow, that's kind of interesting. Black woman, you know, doing the same thing. I said, nothing new under the sun. Ain't that so? All right. So right here, America's Joe Lewis versus the Axis, the Negro soldier. See here, it's like, yes, he's carrying a gun for us. But then when he comes back over here, his white fellow soldier can still carry a gun and use a gun, you know, responsibly. But this black man, when he comes over, he has to be disarmed and might be a victim of gun violence. Now, here, here's a Christian girl in Nigeria, right, that was um, about two, three days ago, look up the story, that was um, um, uh, dragged from her home or where she was, that was um, uh, lynched, and I think she was burned, too. Right? They might have even cut off her head after, we're not too sure. Right? And, 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 and this is the Nigeria situation. Right? So we use this as a counterbalance to say that, look what's going on over there. And before we over here can even say anything about that over there, and I notice both of these things happen almost at the same time, either the same day or in the, in the same 24, no more than a day apart, both of these incidences. The one in Buffalo, New York, and the incident in, in, in Nigeria as well, you know, and the results and the aftermath is all the same. So a lot of us talk about, oh, we're going to go to Africa, and, and there's, we have a lot of people in different parts of Africa. I'm not saying that the continent as a whole, but we need to definitely know the real of wherever we're at, you know, and recognize that these people have their own particular peculiar situations that are historical, so from someone. But what I'm saying is this, is that if we cannot even um, deal with certain things over here where we have freedom of speech, right, and generally speaking, still freedom of speech don't mean that what you say people don't like, you know, because things people say that we don't like and, you know, Time and opportunity, same thing with things that we say. We're, we're quite aware of that. But generally speaking, overall, there's not the trauma and the fear like over there. Now, after the murder of this um, of this Christian girl, you think the next person, either the Christians, the Nigerian black Christians are going to censor themselves, right? 
uh, they're going to censor themselves. Right? So when people talk about, well, these are our black brothers, I, I have to question some things right here. You know who are my black brothers, firstly and foremostly? My fellow black brothers over here in the Americas and the Caribbean, right? In the Americas, North America, South America, the Caribbean. These are my brothers over here, especially we who share this 400-year experience. This is my brothers. These are like my cousins. Maybe some of them are, are cousins, right? Our cousins are over there, right? But even among our cousins, there's a situation going on. And I'm using this as a kind of a, 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 a contrast, right? To contrast, to say, isn't it, first of all, interesting how this is happening, right, over, you know, how this is happening over here, right? And then also how this is happening right over there, right? And many of us will be, if, if, what's interesting is that if the, if the thing, the Buffalo incident didn't happen, there's a likelihood that, um, that we've been talking about just this. A lot of us, you know, there's a lot of ones heal up to Sarnetta Studios and, and Morpheus and even um, Rob Bourne. We caught a little bit of that. That's the kind of real sober reasonment that we really, you know, appreciate love. We love the other reasonments too, but that was, that was good there. You know, it was very, very informative, especially the brother Morpheus when he went into the Arabic and the breakdown because I understand that too. And a lot of our people don't understand that you know, regarding even so-called these religions or faith, you know, and then we'll say, well, we have people who are Muslims over here. You see what I'm saying? But notice there's a difference with the Muslim over here, the black Muslims and those black African Muslims over there. You see what I'm saying? Same thing when we notice black Christians. and But black Christians in Africa seem to be somewhat similar, right, to so-called black Christians over here, especially the latter-day black Christians. You, you, you follow what I'm saying? They're under the f same form of counterfeit Christianity. Because right now, if these same ones had done this to a white Christian, say, 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 in, you know, a community with a white Christian, white Christians respond a little different. Yes, there's some who are peaceful, like the Roman Catholics, they're on that level of, you know, they, they'd be like peaceful on that level because there's a whole strategy, political strategy of that right there. But what I'm trying to say is that in South Africa, the Boers, the rest of them, you know, the Afrikaners, they consider themselves Christian too. <laughs> Just to show that contrast there. And they're reading the same Bible we're reading, right? Same thing with some of us, but we want to say that here's where it's kind of is different with we the black Jews, right? Especially of the line of the tribe of Judah, since we already now recognize outside of the paradigm we're in, how many of our other brothers and sisters, you know, and those in other regions uh, historically were able to defend the faith. So when I talk about Ethiopia, I see something in historical Judeo-Coptic, Judeo-Christian Ethiopia, which is very similar in them defending themselves from, from um, domestic, but especially from foreign enemies that threaten their existential existence. It reminds me, in principle, right, of what we hear the modern state of Israel or hear the advocates or supporters saying that Israel has a right to exist and Israel has a right to defend itself. And I'm saying, do we black people, especially coming here from we in the Americas, do we have the right to defend, right? Do we have the right to, to self-defense, right? So, you know, this is the, the young um, lady, you know, um, and um, this is maybe an example of, you know, some of the threats over there, the whole Boko Haram, right, over there. And, um, yeah, so... We just need to consider our position. We need to consider, you know, what we're talking about, repatriation or, or returning to Africa. We need to do more research. We need to look at things a little more objectively, right? And we need to, it's almost like, um, what's that guy's name? The singer, the singer. Who was the singer? Um, um, the one in New York, New York, uh, Frank Sinatra. He said, like, if I can make it here, I can make it anywhere. Right. I'm not quite saying that. I'm saying that if we don't do certain things here, right, how can we really do anything anywhere? Right. All right. So black people, right, black people in general, but especially we, the black Jews of the line of the tribe of Judah, we have a right to defend ourselves. We should have the right to exist. But do black people, do you, do you really think so? All right. And how does it compare every time in the media? Something happens in the state of Israel, right? 
why is it that we always hear the politicians and everyone basically saying that, you know, not all, but many do say this. It's something that is quite popular, right, that is said, right? And as a principle, we agree with the principle, but we want to apply the principle to our people because we are the ongoing victims, on and on. It's, 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 it... I'm going to seal up right here, brothers and sisters. You know, already been already been kind of long-winded on this right here, but I think it's just important to talk about these two, like a tale of two cities, right? Here and there. Shalom, Chabarim, shalom.